Early 18th century London was a war zone. One in ten women were working as prostitutes and street crime was going through the roof. But out of all that squalor, there was one man who not only stood out, he ran the show. Now this is the story of a man who wasn't a pirate, a highwayman or a thief in the strictest sense of the word. In fact, at one point he held one of the highest positions in London society. But he was still a crook. His name was Jonathan Wilde, and at the beginning of the 18th century, he was the biggest crook in London. Young Jonathan could whack his way to riches just like the rest of them, but that's not why he was famous. He was famous because he was the godfather of organised crime in the 18th century, the Al Capone of his day. He controlled every known criminal in the city. Nothing of any significance got stolen without him first giving the nod and everything that was stolen made him money, in one way or another. And yet, to the majority of Londoners, Jonathan Wilde was a model of respectability, a man with connections to the government and the law. So, how did he do it? If you think crime in London is bad now, then he should have been here in the 1700s. The place was alive with it, along with the usual suspects, uh, muggers, pickpockets, roughnecks. You had your gangs of upper-class thrill-seekers roaming the streets and violently accosting people. Whey! Your brake light's not working. Shut it! Now, according to the London Journal, reports of highway hold-ups were coming in not daily, but by the hour. And our man Jonathan Wilde had his finger firmly in every dodgy pie. And, if I've got my bearings right, he lives in that house over there. Wilde bought this house in 1719. It's almost next to the main criminal court of London, the Old Bailey, and it was financed entirely by crime. What's that one? I've come to see Mr Jonathan Wilde. What about? Uh, lost property, something like that. Has he got an appointment? What? Has that got an appointment? No. Typical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't always this difficult to meet Mr Jonathan Wilde. No, far from it. In fact, he started off coming from very humble beginnings. Jonathan, I baptise thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. He was born in, of all places, Wolverhampton and baptised on the 6th of May, 1683. He was the son of a buckle maker. By the time he was 18, Jonathan was himself an accomplished buckle maker. He also had a wife and a child, both of whom he abandoned around 1708 when he upped sticks and ran away to London. So far, so reprehensible, I'm sure you'll agree. However, when Wilde first arrived in London, he very quickly got into debt, something about a horse not being paid for or something. In fact, he spent the first four years in a debtor's prison. This is where Jonathan did his time, the Wood Street Compter. It was, even by the standards of the day, a dreadful place. Ending up in a debtor's prison was not like going to an ordinary jail, three years with time off for good behaviour, and you're out. Oh, no. The only way out of a debtor's prison was to pay your debts, and that's where your problems started. You see, going to a debtor's prison in the 18th century wasn't free. Here's the deal. As soon as you enter the Compter, you pay an admission fee, which is added to your existing debt, and you pay a discharge fee. This is basically rent for your bed and board, and no one gets out until the whole lot has been paid off. And that's just the legal side. The problems start because the people who ran the prisons paid for the privilege, and they made their profits from extracting monies and garnish from the prisoners. Extra straw for your bed, sir? That's a farthing. Bread that isn't stale and mouldy, another penny. And then there's your wine and women, all at very reasonable prices. Without the garnish, the Compter was little more than a death sentence. When your money ran out, you ended up in the hole, a windowless cell deep under the ground. Here, deaths ran at between four and eight a week. 
But if you had the wherewithal, then life could be quite sweet. Jonathan Wilde must have had the wherewithal because whilst he was in jail, he was given what's known as the liberty of the gate. In other words, he was made a trustee. Oi! When do you reckon I'll be able to see him then? Oh! Mr. Wilde! You got an appointment? No, not really, but I've no. Absolutely bloody typical. Hey! You tell him I remember him when he wasn't such a big shot. Well, I do. Having liberty of the gate meant that Wilde was given the responsibility of checking in new prisoners. As such, he became acquainted with the daily business that went on, in and around the gate, most of which was either illegal, immoral, or it gave you a very nasty rash. Oh, Mary has finished Yeah, not bad. It was here that Jonathan Wilde first met Mary Milliner. Some say Mary was a Thames waterman's wife. Who supplemented her meagre budget by offering, for a little garnish, of course, acts of kindness and comfort to the staff of the jail, and one or two of the better-off prisoners, and three blokes she met on the street on the way, and well, you know the kind of thing. Ooh, it's a bit of cold out there tonight. What's your name? Mary Milliner. What's your name? Jonathan. Wild. Oh. Call Mary. I'll warm you up. I'll take you to a nice place. Oh, that'd be nice. Oh, Mr. Wild. <laughs> Here, Johnny, have you ever thought of becoming a... What's that? Jonathan took to Mary straight away, saying that, compared with her experience in ways of getting money from their rightful owners, he was you but a child. You shall be my twang, and I shall be your buttock. <laughs> <laughs> Your beauty is only outweighed by your wiliness, my mm. pretty. Oh, give us a kiss, darling. I'll give you more than that. Mm. Step into my office. Oh, I'd love to. In 1712, a law was passed which effectively declared an amnesty on prisoners of debt. Wilde was released and went straight into business with Mary Milliner. She was his buttock and he was her twang. Buttock and Twang might sound like Dolly Parton's backing group to you and me, but in the 1700s, it was a phrase that everyone was familiar with. <laughs> Come here. Come on, darling. The job of the Buttock, that's Mary, is to distract the customer, this man, in some way. Drop them. Whilst her partner, the Twang, hits him on the head with a blunt <laughs> instrument. <laughs> Johnny Quinn. Had Jonathan Wilde remained a twang, it's unlikely we would ever have heard of him. But, unlike most of the thugs that plied the twanging trade, Jonathan had a brain, and pretty soon he could extract quite a bit more from his victims than just the contents of their pockets. Shut up! This is what Jonathan's new enterprise was all about. It's a pocketbook that was stolen from one of Mary's customers, and it shows that it, he, he must have been a man of some wealth. It's got columns with incomings and outgoings, but the important thing is here, at the front, it's the man's name and address. Stolen pocketbooks were highly valued amongst the criminal fraternity because they'd usually been stolen from a gentleman of esteem, the kind of gentleman whose wives and families would be devastated if they ever found out what their husband's hobby really was or what they were actually doing the night they lost the pocketbook. He's been a naughty boy. Such men were only too happy to pay a handsome reward for the return of said pocketbook, especially if it came with a promise to keep shtum about the circumstances of its loss in the first place. He's got a pretty penny. Next. Hey, excuse me, you long streak. I've been here about three hours. You got an appointment to see Mr Wilde? Um, yes. Well, it might be in. <laughs> might not. Might be in, might not. Uh. I hope um, Jonathan Wilde's a bit more friendly than him, but I doubt it because even by his mid-twenties he'd built up a business based on his three main principles, theft, bribery and extortion. 
a business that was to take him from small-time crook to undisputed godfather of the London underworld. <laughs>